All right. Welcome, everybody. I hope you've had a chance to grab something to, uh, to drink, something to eat. And we're going to have some of that as well after the uh, presentation. So today, uh, we have a, uh, a, a kind of an interesting agenda. We're going to have a, a panel that's going to be about 45, 50 minutes probably, some Q&A. And then we're going to have uh, a time for you to answer and ask some deep questions with some of our technical folks that are going to be sitting around the room. So this event tonight is actually sponsored by the IMC. And I want to tell you a little bit about the IMC, but it's also really in cooperation. They're helping us a lot with this is the embedded world. And uh, I want to do a, a shout out and thanks to uh, Benedict. And uh, many of you have seen or know Benedict. He's, he's the guy behind the scenes making sure everything's running. He's in charge of the, uh, of the event and uh, the message here. So Benedict, thank you so much for everything. And Keith Kreischer, who is the... Uh, the uh, executive director of the IMC, which is the uh, IoT M2M Council. So, Keith, if you want to come up and say just a couple of quick words. Got him. Yeah, hi. And, uh, hey, thanks to everybody for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, we're hoping to have a very interesting program for you. Like Fred said, please help yourself to refreshments and uh, something to eat. Uh, and we'll get going in just a minute here. But just a quick word uh, of thanks to Benedict Vera from uh, Nuremberg Mesa and, uh, and his team for helping us out and get this off the ground. Uh, uh, it's really been a, uh, uh, a great grassroots effort, and we appreciate it. Uh, yeah, the IMC uh, is sponsoring this evening. And, uh, you know, for those that don't know us, uh, we started uh, in 2014, uh, basically uh, uh, with an eclectic group of IoT solutions providers. They came to us and, and asked us to start an association for the IoT sector. And, um, you know, I wish I could say there was a grand strategic vision to all that, but uh, actually that's not the case. Um, we really started just putting out content, pretty much anything we could get our hands on. Uh, use cases, white papers, blogs, newsletters. And we didn't ask people who wanted access to that content to pay us anything, but we did ask them to identify themselves as buyers of IoT technology, not sellers. We asked them to give us permission to talk to them, to join our organization and work with us. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, that, was a, that was a prerequisite. Uh, we asked uh, them crucially for fairly extensive tabulatable by, uh, demographic information. And that whole effort turned out to be a lot more successful than we ever would have hoped. Today, the IMC has 25,000 rank and file members. We call them adopter members. Uh, and we have uh, over 30 companies on our board that, uh, uh, that joined us to gain access to those adopters of IoT technology. We've got a few board members in the audience here tonight. Raquel from Ignion, just wave of the hand. Uh, I know Arthur from uh, AV Systems is with us. Uh, I know all the folks from Microsoft, uh, just a wave of the hand. Uh, thanks so much for you guys for being here and for supporting our efforts. And, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've talked with uh, Nuremberger, Nuremberger Messer for some time about cooperation. Uh, this is really our first step in that direction. We're assessing the IoT market and how it intersects with the embedded world, uh, with the embedded markets. And we're going to talk about that this evening. Fred's got some interesting statistics. We've done some original research about how these two marketplaces intersect. And with that, I would toss back to Fred. Very good. Thank you, Keith. So um, I, we're, going to, we're going to go through this. So uh, my name is Fred Jens. And the reason I'm up here is I actually chair the events committee we chair the events committee for the, uh, for the IMC. So I am the, uh, the CEO and founder of a company called IoT Launch. It's a consulting services company. We focus on basically knowledge, ecosystem, and, 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 and execution. So we got a really exciting panel today. And the way we're going to do this because of just the microphone and the setup, I'm going to have each speaker come up and speak from the podium, and then we'll all come to the stage and ask some Q&As. I think it'll be more comfortable for everybody instead of sitting there. Um, what I want to do first is I want to take you through just some summaries, very, very simple, 
like I said, we did a, we did a survey to our rank and file membership. We asked them about 15 questions. There was a lot of data. We don't have a lot of time. But what I think I want to talk about is the burning desire for the embedded market to connect everything. Everything is getting connected. And we found that it was peanut buttered across all industries. Embedded products go everywhere. So it's a, it's a very cross-industry opportunity, even though it's identified as the embedded market. And 70% of the respondents said it was very important. So then we said, well, what does very mean? And what we found is we asked them on a scale, and it was basically about a, a 4.5, 4.43, 4.5 out of 5 in terms of level of importance. And I think you see that as you walk around the event and the shows, you're seeing a lot more three-letter acronyms in a lot of these embedded booths than that starting with an I and ending in a T. Now, the other thing that was interesting is we look at the purchasing of IoT technology by the embedded market. And what, what I find fascinating about this is, you know, we think about, you know, bundled solutions where you buy maybe the hardware, the board designer is involved. That's kind of the embedded space. Well, we now have embedded SIMs, and we have embedded MZs and data plans, and we're seeing more and more bundling. So we were very interested to see kind of how is it going in terms of how are people adopting and how are people purchasing. And it was, you know, they're, they're not quite a third, a third, a third, but pretty much, let's just call it a third, a third, a third. A third of the embedded market just buys the radios. They kind of don't, you know, radios and hardware. We're, we're building boards. We let our customers or our customers' customer manage it. Another third basically buys them in they may buy the data plan shortly thereafter. And about a third are starting to buy everything together. And you're starting to see some providers of technologies that are offering embedded SIM and potentially data plans to go. So whether this is real or the intention, it's a survey. We don't know. But I think it's directional that there's probably more folks in this space trying to buy more bundled. And that makes sense, is it's becoming more needed and, and a higher, higher use of these technologies in this space. Easier is better. And really, that's what we're going to talk about today in this panel. And it's all about how to make IoT easier to adopt and to implement from the embedded space. So I'm going to go quickly back to this slide. I want to introduce our panel. And the panelists will, will come up one at a time, speak at the podium, and then we'll just return to the, to the stage for Q&As. So first of all, I've, I want to introduce uh, Filippo, F Filippo uh, Colliani from, uh, from ST Micro Electronics. So you can do this, and you can do this. Sorry. That clicker. Can I start? Uh? Yes. Do a couple, sir. There you go. Okay. Thanks very much to be here. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I will start to do, give uh, a, a fast overview about ST Microelectronics. ST Microelectronics, okay, is uh, one of the largest semiconductor company in the world. We are around 48,000 people uh, with a lot of office uh, uh, manufacturing sites around uh, the world. But I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, means uh, if you want, I think that we can share the chart. Uh, uh, we can talk about that. ST is focusing on a different kind of uh, application, from automotive application uh, such as uh, car electrification and car digitalization. We are focusing on uh, personal computer, uh, personal mobile phone, consumer application for high volume application, and we are focusing on uh, industrial application. That is one of the, uh, the today topics. When we talk about uh, industrial application, we are talking about uh, smart city, smart on building automation for uh, new application like uh, presence detection, or we can talk about smart light for smart public light or smart home light. 
Uh, we can talk about the smart grid and smart meter application, whereas ST we are a leader for uh, semiconductor provider. Uh, we can talk about uh, factory 4.0. Uh, predicting maintenance condition monitoring, asset tracking, here there is a big word since you can talk about uh, good guarantee, a lot of application. In all these uh, lists of industrial use cases, uh, ST today is able to provide the key bricks, means all the key product to create a smart sensor. For example, let us start from uh, microcontroller. Today we have a really huge family of STM32 microcontroller from high performance with the microprocessor family with the ultra low power with a new that we just announced last year, STM32 U5, that is a, a flagship of our microcontroller. We born two years ago a new wireless system on chip family that today is a STM32 WB that is a BLE, Thread, Zigbee, uh, the new, uh, that is not more new since just two years on the market, uh, stf 2 wl that is LoRa compliant, uh, and then other uh, product is uh, boarding in this uh, big uh, family. But we are not providing only microcontroller. Since in ST, we are uh, taking care also about uh, security. Since uh, when we talk about uh, smart sensor, security is really important. And so we create, we have the secure microcontroller that is able, uh, where you can put the secure key, that is the, our ST safe, uh, that is also for mass market. We have solution for uh, embedded SIM, for example, that is uh, uh, for mobile network. Uh, and we are leader in for what concerning sensor. So sensor, uh, for what concerning industrial sensor, we can talk about uh, uh, motion with a dedicated sensor for industrial, like, for example, inclinometer, or accelerometer that is arriving up to uh, 16G, 32G, or 400G. But we have also new sensor like uh, motion sensor with uh, intelligent sensor processing unit. What, what is it? It's a new sensor that is embedding the DSP that gives you more capability to work with artificial intelligence inside the sensor to save power consumption. Uh, we have all concerning uh, environmental sensor, so standard pressure, uh, temperature, with a new also, for example, for presence detection, a new sensor that is a TMOS, is a thermal sensor that is able to capture the infrared of the human body irradiation is that around 10 micrometer. And so you are able to detect how many people there are inside this room using this kind of sensor. But um, let us uh, move forward. Uh, ST today is not able to provide only the key bricks to enabling um, the smart sensor solution, but we are able to provide also some uh, evaluation board. Evaluation board are a proof of concept. It's uh, something that uh, we are developing to create, to uh, reduce the time to market, to test our product. Together with the evaluation board, we are providing also uh, all the firmware library, the bug interface, uh, and the development tool to work on it. And on top of that, uh, to complete the ecosystem, uh, we need uh, to work, work uh, collaborate with partners uh, to create uh, and arrive to the cloud. For example, with uh, cloud service provider as uh, Microsoft uh, to give uh, a close the loop to create end-to-end -end proof of concept, or what we call sensor to cloud. To close, uh, that is uh, the, the last chart that is, uh, in my opinion, really important. It's important today that uh, the topic of today is uh, right way machine to machine that in our opinion is one, is a really important protocol and uh, data structure to create, to improve, uh, to reduce the data throughput versus the cloud. But in top, to better reduce the uh, data throughput versus to the cloud, it's important that the computation is moving, uh, is not done only on the cloud, but also inside the smart sensor, or working with high performance microcontroller, or using new sensor 
available in ST with machine learning and artificial intelligence. So you can switch off all the sensor and save energy, and at the end, when there is some alert or some special value to send, you can send it directly to the cloud, reducing the uh, data throughput. For me, it's, uh, it's all. I hope that I was not too long. Thank you, Filippo. So, uh, for the time. No, thank you. So our next speaker is, uh, so there's a method to the madness. So we're going from the embedded controller to the radio, to the bridge technology, to the cloud. So kind of bottom to top of stack. So the next speaker is from Nordic and Nordic Semiconductor and his name is Martin Lesman. Martin, we welcome you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so my name is uh, Martin Leasun. I'm a technical marketing manager uh, specialized for cellular IoT. So I will mostly focus about our cellular IoT offering today. But uh, first off, a little bit about Nordic Semiconductor. We are a fabulous semiconductor company, which is uh, experts on low power wireless embedded solutions. And we make basically microcontrollers with integrated radios. We have been a market leader for Bluetooth low energy. And uh, we also have support for Thread, Zigbee, Matter uh, on the short range side. And uh, we also have a cellular IoT product, which is supporting LTM, NB-IoT, and GPS. Uh, we are also moving into the Wi-Fi spectrum now. And uh, typical for Nordic Semiconductor is that everything needs to be low power. So everything has been built from the ground up to be low power. And, uh, I'm going to talk more about that for our 9160. So this is our cellular product. It's a system in package. It has an application processor, ARM Cortex M33, which is own uh, dedicated flash and RAM. You have one uh, megabytes of flash, 256 kilobytes of RAM. And that's just for the user. And he can uh, write his own code and flash that on that uh, application processor. It's open. And we have a fully fledged SDK to support that. We also developed a, a modem with the LTM and NBI support uh, and GPS, which is also built from the ground up to be a low power. And we provide our customers with the modem firmware. And uh, uh, two times each year or something, we come up with a new modem firmware for the customers to, to maybe update if they want to with new features and also uh, better. Uh, optimized uh, solutions. Of course, our uh, SDK is also updated uh, <laughs> over the time, and uh, we provide that for our customers. Our solutions support uh, application firmware over there and also modem firmware over there. So that's uh, something unique with us. We, we are not just a modem. We have a fully fledged system in package. You have the power management site C inside and an RF front end. So basically, you need a, a battery or a, another power source, some sensors, a SIM card, and the antennas for the GPS and LT, depending on what you need. Of course, everything is built low power. Uh, I've already talked about that. And uh, another point with our NRF 9160, we want to make it as easy as possible, as we tried with, uh, as we have done with our uh, short range devices. And that also includes our SDKs, all, all of our complementary tools, and that is offered for free for our customers to use. So we kind of only earn money on selling chips and cloud services right now. So we try to make it as easy as possible for customers to get fast time to market. And that's why we provide open source SDKs and all the nice tools that we have. You've probably already seen the power profiling kit uh, around here, people using that to measure current consumption, which is a cheap, easy to use tool for, for debugging, especially for cellular devices. More details around our 9160. We have the ARM Cortex M33 ARM uh, application processor for the user application. And we also support ARM Trust Zone and the crypto cell for security and cryptography. And the uh, operation uh, is around 3 to 5.5 volts. And uh, it's a very small form factor. And everything is tightly integrated into a 10 by 16 by 1 millimeter form factor. And it's a pre-certified uh, system in package. It uh, also has global coverage. So you can use this device all around the world. So basically, that means uh, 
uh, single uh, design for our customers. Yeah, of course, ultra low power. I'm just showcasing some uh, specifications here. Uh, 18 micrams at uh, 81.92 EDRX intervals and 2.7 micrams for PSM floor current. And the important part here is that this is just for some specific scenarios. So for a total average currents, we have kind of optimized in all corners. So when comparing to other devices, it's very important to look at the total average current consumption because that has the most impact on the battery life. Here's just uh, another diagram of what's inside of the system in package, kind of the highlights, highlighting that we have a, a chipset inside there with the application processor for the uh, user to do whatever they want with, with the SDK and a modem, which we provide a modem firmware. So what we try to do uh, for our customers is kind of solving all the pain points during their journey uh, of development. First thing is to make a great uh, product. We make a system on chips for uh, short range devices and a system in package for, for the 91 here. I mean, we might make uh, uh, connectivity stacks and uh, also the SDK for our customers. Our uh, SDK supports uh, Zephyr real-time operating system and we also deliver out the li libraries and drivers to use this uh, SDK for our, for our customers. Also, extensive software and hardware development tools. We make the, our development kits fully available to buy from any distributors. And also we have complementary tools on, uh, on the desktop, which is free to use uh, to, to help out development, basically. Of course, our De DevZone, which is our support community, we have uh, around 40 uh, tech support engineers working uh, day and night to answer all of our uh, customer questions. We have an uh, opportunity to answer them privately and publicly. And we also have a great community helping each other out for, for, for our devices. And an important part with Seller that you need partners to make things uh, work as it should. Uh, to make it a bit simplified picture, you have the device, which in this case is the 9160. Then you have the network, and you have the cloud side. And everything needs to kind of work to be uh, in ultra low power, let's say, uh, for that example. So that means that the network needs to support PSM features, EDRX features, and the cloud needs to support uh, optimized protocols like the lightweight machine-to-machine -machine protocol. And also, we uh, have cloud connectivity partners. We have our own NRF cloud with uh, location services and new features also coming in, uh, which provides uh, better uh, location for our customers with regard to power consumption. We have LT location supported and also assisted GPS and predicted GPS. It's basically uh, downloads and uh, memories and Almanac data from the LT network which means that you can go from 60 seconds of time to first fix with GPS down to five seconds. And that saves a lot of power consumption, uh, especially for uh, our customers using battery operated devices. So that's a nice feature that we have. And also we have support for uh, the big uh, other uh, clouds. Also, we have now an extensive partner program for solution partners and de design partners to really make our devices work uh, on the networks and on the clouds, and uh, pushing for the same target to be low power and make it easier for our customers to develop products. And at the end, the ha you have the customer product. This is kind of just highlighting what we have. So we provide the whole complete cellular IoT solution. Thank you very much. Martin, thank you. Thank you very much. So there's a, there's a theme to embedded. A lot of these embedded technologies are running on very low power. So some of the heavier traditional protocols are really not well received in terms of the use case or the business case. So what I thought was interesting is Martin touched a little bit on that whole buy bundled. They had the SIM and they had the, the, the data plan. So very interesting. And now I want to introduce uh, Jim Wirt. He's the CTO and co-founder of a company called Tardibit. And he uh, and the Tardibit uh, company really work on bridging this low power environment to the hyperscale cloud environment. So Jim, stage is yours. Thank you, Fred. Okay. So 
I'm here to talk about what we do with uh, Tardibit in our IoT bridge. Uh, we are a LPWA to uh, Azure IoT uh, bridging, uh, bridging framework. So really, you know, when people try to figure out where we fit, IoT is a huge space, uh, ranging anywhere from wired solutions, Wi-Fi, high category LTE, 5G. Where we are, we're, uh, we're in LTE CAD-M. And narrowband IoT, LoRaWAN, satellite, bandwidth constrained devices, power constrained devices, where the, the typical SDKs provided by the hyperscalers simply, uh, uh, to, I should say, shouldn't be used. And so we end up picking up a lot of different types of devices. We talk with devices over lightweight M to M. We talk with devices that use co-op. We talk devices with proprietary TCP and UDP protocols. There's a, there's a wide range of brownfield and greenfield devices in the space that all need to be connected to the, the Azure ecosystem. So we do this across a, a number of different products. So we have our Lightweight M to M product, all about narrowband IoT, LTE CAD M using the Lightweight M to M standard. We support, uh, we support the 1.0 and 1.1 standard. We're, uh, we're in the process of rolling out the new 1.2 standard as well. We have, and this is, the key here is, is that when people say, why, uh, why is this necessary? The, there's a lot of toolkits out there. There's a lot of samples about kind of how to do the five minutes to wow demo. How do you get started fast? Well, you know, getting started fast is a great place to start. But at a certain point, you actually have to get ready for production. And when you do that, you start worrying about how long the battery's gonna last, how long the, how much data am I gonna consume? How is this device gonna really work in the field? Can I update it in the field? Can I go and get diagnostic information out of the, this piece of equipment? And this is where we, we really strive to bring all of that in a easy to use, production ready way into the, the Azure ecosystem. We also have our bespoke functionality, so the ability to consume all these other different protocols out there. We work with a, a number of different connectivity providers. Uh, we, we work very closely with companies like Twilio uh, for, as a SIM provider with Iridium on the satellite side, trying to bring together as many different ways to get, uh, get not only the device data, but also that connectivity metadata into the platform. And lastly, we also work very closely with the LoRa ecosystem. So, we, we identified in this same LPWA space a problem where there's multiple different LNS providers that have a very wide range of support that they each offer. We go and harmonize all these different LNS providers with a common set of hundreds of device decoders from 50 plus vendors, enabling really kind of seamless integration. In, again, in the rich DTDL Azure modeling, trying to get it in, not just into the kind of the first level IoT hub, but get the data into IoT Central, get the data directly into Azure Digital Twins. Try to compress out some of the, the five minute to wow samples of, hey, just import this Azure function and life is gonna be great. It's, hey, let's you deploy this thing. It's a product, it's reliable, it's redundant, it's secure, and it's ready for a, a production workload. So uh, you'll be able to find us over in the, uh, the back corner after we're done with the panel. We have both the uh, ST uh, demo running with uh, Lightweight M2M to -M using a uh, QuakeTel module. We also then have a, uh, the Nordic 9160 as well as their uh, Thingy 91 uh, talking to our IoT bridge and uh, feeding data into uh, multiple Azure services. So I encourage you to come back, talk to me. I, I can uh, go into a, a lot of details about uh, the, the differences between Lightweight M2M, -M, MQTT, details of power consumption and PSM and EDRX and pretty much anything else you can uh, try to stump me with. So uh, I, I look forward to, uh, to some, some hard questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim, that's great. So a, a couple of, again, observations. Um, not all networks are created equal. Not all protocols are created equal. Uh, so there's a lot of heterogeneous stuff in IoT, and that's why it's kind of hard to consume and understand how to make it easy for people who are new to IoT. So when we look at some of these embedded suppliers and builders who are here implementing IoT, we want to try to t rationalize things. While all these technologies are very different, one thing is very common. Customers want everything. 
and enterprise customers want it easy. Another thing that's becoming more and more common every day is customers are moving to the cloud. So while you might be a large enterprise and you might have something in LoRa and something in NBIT and something over on satellite, you have one set of business applications that you're trying to build. And frequently those business applications end up in Microsoft Azure. And that's why I'm really proud to introduce Mo Tanaban, who is the uh, VP in charge of the, uh, the Azure IoT, the Edge, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So Mo, thank you. Come on up. I'm going to give you this and the clicker. All right, thanks, Brett. Folks, uh, it's great to be here with you. Good evening to all of you. Uh, and uh, I'm super excited to be here and talk to you about uh, our cloud IoT platform, Azure IoT, and how we use it in conjunction with, uh, with some of the products that you already saw from uh, ST, Nordic, uh, and uh, uh, we, were go we are going to uh, look at how our IoT uh, industry is evolving a little bit. I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on that. So just a quick uh, poll in the audience. How many of you are in hardware business? It's embedded world at the end of the day, right? Good, like about 30%. How many of you are in software business? Yeah, that's pretty consistent. And you see there is more and more uh, the, the size of the uh, IoT TAM market is shifting from hardware towards software. And it's not that hardware is shrinking. Hardware is growing by 10% every year. But software is growing much faster. So it, and that's what I'm going to talk about, that things are becoming software defined. And you can see it across, this is the first embedded world that I have seen that software defined X and software defined Y is becoming a term, is, is a norm. And I'm going to show you what, what that uh, means and how it's happening. So, uh, just a quick introduction on me. I uh, lead Azure Light Edge organization. Everything that is outside of a data center in Azure Edge is within uh, my organization. That includes uh, servers and even gateways based on Windows IoT. It includes Azure IoT, all the products that you saw uh, in previous presentations. That includes our secure, software, uh, secure IoT connectivity platform, which we call Azure Sphere, and also our AI platform, uh, which we call Azure Percept. <clears throat> so this is what I'm talking about. If you look at this picture, you see a spectrum of different types of endpoints. Uh, if I look at from the left side, uh, is basically sensors and really constrained devices. Then you get more system level uh, devices that have multiple of these sensors and actuators and compute boxes. Then you have servers and data centers and then you have operators edge, which is because of 5G is becoming very prominent. And then you have the cloud and multi-cloud. What we used to do and we're still doing, let me see if I can get this working. The software stack that we use to develop applications here is quite different from the software stack that we use to develop application here. Different than this, different than this. So you have a different set of developer skills, developer tools, code looks different. We're still doing that. But two things are happening. One is customers are becoming very cost conscious and there is something called developer economy. Every line of code that you write, there is a dollar sign or euro sign associated with it. So if you have a dollar sign here, a dollar sign here, a dollar sign here, they just add up. But if you can write a line of code that you can run it here, the same line of code, you can run it here, the same line of code, you can run it here, your cost of development is dollar divided by three. So that is one trend that is driving a major change in the industry. The second thing is, we are standardizing how software runs on hardware. We're abstracting hardware, big time. And it's a wonderful thing, both for software world and the hardware world. 
there is a, we have landed as an industry on Linux containers to package code with runtime and other libraries that you need to run that code. And you can ship it. You don't care as a developer. Is it going in, in a Windows world? Is it going in a Linux world? Is it going into this type of Linux, that type of Linux, this type of hardware? Is it Intel? Is it ARM? You don't care. You package your runtime with your code, and you just ship it out as a container. And then that works well for a while. Then we realize, wow, there are way too many containers. So we need to orchestrate them. We need to manage them. And as an industry, we've landed on something called Kubernetes. You may have heard of it. Kubernetes now allows you to get packaged software targeted for here, 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 in a highly available mode. Uh, and you basically don't care if, if these devices go down or come up. Kubernetes can, can uh, uh, replace them with a different node that is available and ready to go. And with that model, we're achieving a lot of developer economy. And because of it, we do a lot more in software now than we used to do in low-level, uh, bare metal, or even hardware. And that is a major, major shift in the industry right now. Then when, uh, when you have this uh, software-defined car, software-defined CNC machine, software-defined CT scan machine, software-defined, uh, I don't know, uh, plastic injection, ex uh, aluminum extrusion, all these machines are software-defined. The machine builder, if they want to change something, if they want to add a feature, fix a, a, a faulty feature, they don't have to change anything. Today, they either have to go and uh, replace a component, or if they want to do software update, a lot of times, the USB dongle, they have to go and plug it in and, and update the software. All that is going away. They're all these uh, software-defined machines are becoming cloud-managed. And the software developer or the machine builder, they write the next level of software, the next version of software, they just push it out. And I don't know how many of you have heard, read, or drive a Tesla car. You go wake up one morning, and the, the Tesla car says, oh, by the way, I have these three new features. Two, two new games is available to you, and uh, you can measure your speed in this weird way. And then you say, OK, great, I'm going to use it. And the next week, you get another two features. It's a software-defined car. You cannot do that in typical uh, traditional legacy ve uh, vehicles and automobiles. So the whole world is going that way. And this is how it's going that way. One, uh, and, and this is obviously an ecosystem play. <clears throat> we can, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, or SD, or Intel, or Qualcomm, or NXP, nobody can do this alone. It has to come through a series of industry collaboration. And we are very, very engaged and active as a company in various parts of the ecosystem to make sure that we move together as an industry. And one particular uh, category of devices that is very near and dear to, to me is constraint devices. Remember that sensors on the far left side. You've heard that we're going to have 50 billion devices or 60 billion devices by, I don't know, X number of years from now. A lot of those devices, 70% of those devices, are these constraint devices. These are devices that are small, uh, low cost, low power, and if we can even make them battery operated at some point, it's just wonderful because then the cost of deployment of these devices are uh, like they're going to go away. Uh, the largest retailer in the world, physical retailer, is one of our customers, and I, I was in a conversation with, uh, with one of their uh, executives, and he was telling me that, Mo, every camera that we install in our stores we spend $1,400 to 
$1,400 just for the installation fee. It's more than the cost of camera, the camera itself. So when you look at things that are battery operated and wireless, cellular wireless particularly, they are like peel and stick. You just take off the, the double-sided tape, you stick it on the wall, you turn on the uh, light switch, and boom, it starts operating. Registers to the cloud, shows up in your dashboard, and that $1,400 is what? $14 probably. It's ridiculous how much value when you add uh, low power and uh, wireless connectivity together create. So this is something we call wireless framework in Microsoft. We've partnered with uh, some of our silicon partners like ST, uh, module makers, modem, uh, module makers, Quicktel, and Tardabit, which uh, you heard from, uh, to create a fully uh, integrated reference architecture for your uh, IoT devices based on cellular connectivity. And as you can see, they show up in Azure. You can uh, connect them to different Azure services like Azure IoT uh, and, and others, uh, device provisioning service and uh, other services. So with this, I think my team is telling me that it's five minutes a while, so I believe them. I haven't tried them yet myself. But in a fairly uh, short amount of time, we can pull all of this together. And if you have a temperature search sensor, vibration sensor, or uh, whatever uh, end leaf device you have, you can start receiving data in the cloud and do whatever you need to, to do with it. This did not exist before. It would take a teams of engineers and months probably to do something like that. So removing friction in the, in the ecosystem, is, as I've mentioned, is one of the key drivers of scale in, in IoT, and we're very committed to do that. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Fred. You can stay up here and grab a seat. Sure. If you'd like. Thank you. And I'd ask the uh, panelists to come back up, and we've got a, a few good questions. We don't have an enormous amount of time for questions. We want to give people time to, to walk around, ask tough questions of the tech folks that are going to be over on these tables. This is an embedded world. It's one of the highest density of smart people at a trade show on the planet. It's wonderful. So. Uh, Well, I'll sit down. <laughs> Actually, it's in the way. Let these guys be the stars. So a couple questions that we have, and Mo, I think you said it great. 70, 80% of these devices are going to be these, this wireless framework, and they're going to be low-power, battery-powered devices, easy to install, easy and inexpensive to install to really make the business case work. Now, in a battery world, you've got to think about every possible way to inch out savings, data plan and battery. And there's a lot of discussion around protocol. Now, I know that the, the radio guys care, everybody cares, but talk to us a little bit, if you can, about what are the differences in power efficiencies between some of these protocols, whether it's custom, lightweight M2M, MQTT, et cetera. And I'll start with you, Lesman. Yeah, so thank you for the good question. So. Yeah, basically we see that for, for low constrained devices that's going to run on batteries for hopefully years, we see that uh, the protocols have a large effect on the battery life. That's because if you have an IP protocol that uh, needs a high uh, overhead, that means you need to have the radio on for a longer period of time. And the radio on the constrained devices is what uses most power. So the more we can kind of shorten this time, the better for, for the battery life, right? So we see that, for example, for TCP IP based uh, protocols, uh, that is using more overhead than UDP based, for example. And uh, for NB-IoT networks, TCP is not really uh, the way to go there. So that's uh, where UDP is uh, really recommended. And also, if you want to have low power, we see that UDP-based protocols is the recommended way. And that's why we kind of also work together with cloud services to try and convey this message that our customers need low power and that 
that UDP is being used by our customers and it's needed uh, protocol. So UDP based is co-app and lightweight machine to machine protocol. So it's nice to see that's getting more and more traction and, and possible for customers to use now. So, you know, I'll add to that to say, you know, Fred asked a question, it, it, how much impact the protocol has, but I think really it's about the system. So you need the cloud pieces to have the capability to queue up and hold messages for the device until it reports in because it's not always connected anymore. I love, the, I love what's coming now with the smarter sensors where the sensors can do, do more offloading so that you can turn off the main processors, to, turn off the comms processors until the, the impending event has happened to trigger a communication event. And then, you know, there's the, the, there's the, the comms piece in the middle of managing the radio, managing PSM correctly, managing EDRX, and, uh, you know, negotiating the protocols. And, uh, you know, so, so it is from the, the littlest piece at the, the bottom and, uh, you know, some of the, the most, uh, uh, you know, inconsequential circuitry up to the, you know, the details of how the applications work in the cloud that are all part of being successful in these low power solutions. So, anything to add, Filippo? No, no, uh, so, another, another good question, and I think there's always balance, right? The, the IoT is choices and balance, because there's so many technologies involved. In your last slide, Filippo, you mentioned kind of the balance between computational. What's happening in terms of compute at the edge in the, in the, in the right. microcontroller? What's happening in the cloud? You, you talk us about that. Yes, thanks, uh, thanks for the question. It's a really interesting question. Since uh, it's uh, connected to the discussion of uh, low power consumption, since uh, it's important that uh, the idea that the sensor to cloud, that uh, most of the computation today is nice that uh, to have this computation directly uh, in the smart sensor. Why? Since in the smart sensor you can uh, do the computation if you have uh, really a smart sensor and uh, trigger, when you trigger the real event, you can send the information to the cloud. And ST really investing a lot on this kind of concept. We started uh, time ago uh, with a sensor that was embedding uh, a standard uh, uh, like uh, event detection, like uh, tilt detection, uh, tap detection. After that, there was uh, the device, a sensor that was embedding a finite set machine. After that, we developed a device with machine learning that you can create a decision tree. Suppose that you have one accelerometer with machine learning decision tree, connect one, one pressure sensor, and you can detect when the airplane is take off or landing, combining pressure sensor and accelerometer only. So all the device is sleeping, and you can understand when you take off or landing the plane in a really low power mode. And now we developed a new uh, kind of sensor that is the ESPU, Intelligent Sensor Process Unit. Our sensor that is embedding a DSP that gives you the possibility to run artificial intelligence using also Nano Edge. So you can create your uh, uh, artificial intelligence algorithm uh, run inside, directly inside the, the sensor. Meanwhile, all the system is sleeping. When uh, the event is detected, you wake up the system and send the information using LoRa, BLAE, Narobendo IT, or other kind of system. Very good. So, Mo, you mentioned software-defined everything. Well, Embedded folks in the good old days, you mentioned like the old cars and the old this, but in the, even in the old electronics, it was kind of the George Foreman set it and forget it, right? Now we have this life cycle that goes forever and changes that happen frequently. So device management and putting new set points and all that stuff's down there. What is my, I mean, every panelist is going to have something to say about device management because it is a challenge, but where's Microsoft on kind of your importance and how you handle that and, and how you enable that with partners? Sure. So uh, device management used to be I install the device, I plug it in, I screw it to the base or the wall, and then once in a while it fails, I can't try to fix it. If it can't fix it, then I'll throw it out. That was device management. <clears throat> has changed. We've come a long way since then. Right now, uh, in this new uh, cloud-managed and software-defined world of endpoints, it doesn't matter if it's a consumer device like a fridge or if it's a car 
like, uh, like uh, I mentioned Tesla, or uh, industrial machinery. You need to telemetry the device first. That's the key component. That means from outside, you should be able to infer what is happening inside the device. That's telemetry. So you have to have uh, enough uh, metrics in the code and uh, alarms and, and all those good stuff that uh, code inside a device generates that you can look at it through uh, some data analytics and dashboard and see what's going on with the device, health of the device. The second one is you should be able to uh, secure it. Uh, outside access, uh, if somebody actually even gets physical access to the device. So securing the device uh, is a major, but now that our devices are, are remotely accessible, securing the device is a major, major part of device management. Third one is you need to have uh, a set of mechanisms to uh, provision and deprovision the device. Sometimes a device goes from manufacturer to owner one. So you provision it to owner one uh, uh, for a device identity for the owner one, uh, owner one and it charges, uh, it's charged to the account for the owner one, like even a watch or an iPhone. Then you sell your watch, you need to be able to transfer that ownership. So provisioning and deprovisioning and reprovisioning of the device is also the third element of the device management and ultimately is uh, the most important part of any device management suite of services is device update. When you need to fix, when you need to add new features, when you have a security hole that you need to uh, address, all of that you, you should be able to send a, uh, a new uh, firmware or software to the device uh, in a, in a as non-invasive way as possible to uh, get the device to run on the new software. Very good. Other thoughts from anybody? So I'd like to add, you know, one of the things that I, I think we're starting to see in the trend is that configuration management, device management, photo, application updates are all becoming far more dynamic. It used to be, oh, hey, we have a new update, push it out to the fleet. And, uh, you know, you, you measure how long it takes, you hope that eventually you get attainment across all your devices. But what we're finding now is, especially in this low power space where each update might take four to six months of life off the device, people are starting to get much smarter and starting to apply more, I'll say more algorithms and more intelligence to these updates. Well, hey, look, I'm not gonna just upload a list of devices and say, go upload, update all of these. I'm now gonna say, when the device reports in, only if it's in this part of the country, only if it happens to be on this particular network, only if it's exhibiting this particular behavior in its sensors, do I now want to turn around and update this device? In this kind of more intelligent approach to device management and configuration management, I think is one of the, the essential things that, that we've been able to enable using Azure and the Azure services and we've been able to uh, you know, really successfully deploy with these, uh, the, the hardware devices we're working with to really, I think, s elevate to that, that next level of uh, LPWA solutions. Great. So we're gonna have time, w one last question. And the question is uh, always kind of the elephant in the room. And that's talk to us about security. There's all kinds of ways to secure devices at the device level, the network level, on the pipe, in the cloud. What are the state-of-the-art ways in each of your respective segments to, to really improve security? Because it's on everybody's mind. Yeah, so I can start here uh, with uh, 921. You have the first point of security is the SIM card. It needs to be secure, and then you have the modem side. We have a modem firmware which we always update and make sure it's working on the network, it's fully updated if there's uh, any issues. And that's another part of the security. And then it comes to the cloud connection. You need some kind of way to make a secure connection to the cloud. You can have a private APN or other uh, different uh, possibilities to do there. And then you have kind of the secure connection with your cloud. And then it comes to cert certificates, for example, where you need to store them safely on the device itself and handle the communication securely there. So over the LTE network, it's uh, already much security built in the network, but also you need it on the protocol level. So then you have different ways of doing this using DTLS or 
depending on the protocol you're using. So it's kind of many pieces of the puzzles that need to kind of work together here, but uh, yeah. Philippe? Right, yes, you can continue. Yeah. Yes, uh, talking always uh, starting from the low level. So talking always about uh, the smart sensor. Uh, we think that uh, the security is really important. Uh, in fact, uh, in our microcontrol, uh, it means uh, in most of our microcontrol, uh, you can find uh, in the last, uh, uh, like the step 32 5 uh, you can find the trust zone that is uh, a way. Uh, belong also to the ARM architecture that give you the possibility to secure the data. It's, uh, if it's not enough, uh, you can use the crypto hardware engine. So in most of uh, uh, our microcontroller, we are embedding AES, ASH, triple DES for the, um, for the hardware encryption. If it's not, still not enough, since you need always more security, since it depends from different kind of um, application that you're working, we have the secure element. What is a secure element? It's an external secure micro that is the ST safe, that usually is the same micro that are using for the credit card, where you can put in couple with the standard SM32, for example, where you can store there all the secure crypto key or the information that the one you want that uh, access to this uh, information. And on top of that, we are working also that is also really important on the embedded SIM that is also really important for security with our device that the ST4 SIM that is embedded SIM coming from uh, ST Microelectronics. And this one is a uh, low level, give the right uh, compromise of security and low power to create uh, IoT, real IoT security. Very I good. don't know if... Uh, you want to continue? Uh, I can continue it where I can. It, what I can add is security is an interesting one because, uh, first of all, it, it, uh, it commonly involves IT, and IT has no idea what IoT is. Uh, I can't tell you how many exceptions we've had to file for because the IoT solution can't conform to the standard IT security practices that are completely unreasonable and impractical for an IoT solution. And you know, so this is where I'll say that uh, while security is essential, it is important to balance the security you need with the practical reality of what you're deploying. Uh, you know, I, I was recently reading a, a, a master's thesis on lightweight M to M versus MQTT and certificate-based authentication versus pre-shared key is three times the power consumption anytime you need to establish a connection. So hey, certificates may be what is required for your use case, that's great. Understand the cost. Don't do certificates because IT said, oh hey, it's gotta be certificates. You do certificates because you need it. Uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, and I'll be honest, it, it sickens me how many IoT devices, uh, especially in like the asset tracking and PERS space today, still have absolutely no encryption, unsigned applications, unencrypted protocols, and they're praying that you know customers use it on a private APN and that's enough, and yet I, I still see people connecting over the internet, and you know, God, God help us when people figure out what, uh, what they can do with this information. These are all great comments. Uh, what I would add is, Men mentally, when we think about security, we think about three aspects of protecting data. One is when the data is in transit, when we're sending it from A to B. Second is when data is at rest, when we're storing it somewhere. And third is when data is in action, meaning it's being worked on by a CPU, GPU, or, or some form of compute. <clears throat> and a lot of customers come to Microsoft because uh, we've established a pretty good uh, uh, set of credible uh, tools in the market for securing all three stages of uh, data protection. Uh, I agree that uh, security needs to be in, in kind of balance with, uh, with the expectation and the application, but as our world is becoming more and more connected and software defined, then the risks of not having enough security are, are not the type of risks that we want to take. When you're driving a car, or a, you're sitting riding a car that is driving itself, 
Uh, if someone hacks into that car, uh, it can easily be fatal. Uh, if uh, a robot is going through a warehouse and is relying on a computer vision uh, uh, model to avoid op uh, objects and obstacles, if someone maliciously manipulates that model, trained model, it can kill people. Lots of liability. If, uh, and then uh, protection of intellectual property. If uh, you have, uh, as a company, spent years to perfect uh, a machine learning model to uh, recognize patterns of cancerous cells in, in for example, uh, 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 X-raying or scanning lungs, then if you just put it and store it on a device, on your device, on your CT scanner, and somebody steals it, your 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollar model is gone. So there is a lot at risk uh, when it comes to security. And uh, in our view, hardware root of trust is a key element of any, and uh, uh, my colleagues here mentioned a few uh, examples, SIM and embedded secure element and TPM and all of those. So hardware root of trust to, to protect uh, the keys is, is a key element of that. But also a service and software layer that is taking advantage of that hardware root of trust to make sure prevents, first of all, detects and then prevents uh, unauthorized, unwarranted, and malicious access. Well, thank you, guys. I'll tell you, there's uh, a, a lot of wisdom up here. And if you're new to IoT and you're going, oh, my goodness, this sounds like a lot, the good news is, is these four players and many others in the ecosystem are indeed working on levels of cooperation, levels of standards, levels of best practices, frameworks, wireless frameworks that actually help make it easier. And uh, I want to, again, thank you all for your, your wisdom and sharing, but I'd encourage everybody at this point to, to go over to these tables and, and see the few minutes to wow. It is real. It can happen. And it, it, it might sound scary, but it's actually achievable. So thank you all. Thank IMC and thank for the, uh, the MESA and the uh, Embedded World team. We really, uh, really appreciate your participation. Have a wonderful evening tonight. There's uh, more beer, wine, and sandwiches, cocktails, plenty of food, plenty of food and, uh, and enjoy the rest of the show. So thank you so much. Great job.